What's up guys? Today we're going over type one diabetes. As I said, if you have any questions, please drop them in the chat below and we're gonna get started. So remember there's two types of diabetes, type one, type two. Type one is much less common and more rare. Most of the people you're going to be treating or seeing on the boards with diabetes are going to be type two. And that is the insulin resistant one, which I'll do a video on that later. But today we're doing type one, which is also known as um, a lot of people refer to it as juvenile diabetes because it's more common in children. So let's go to the anatomy. So big thing we're, that's going on here is the pancreas. The pancreas has islets of longer hands, which are where the pancreatic beta cells are located. And then we're also dealing with the insulin receptors. That's another thing, but this is the basic anatomy that we're going to be dealing with, with type one diabetes. And so what happens is if you can see my cursor here, there are these beta cells in the pancreas and they are being destroyed. So essentially the body is no longer producing its own insulin and is now going to require either insulin injections or some sort of exogenous insulin in order to continue to um, function properly. So remember what insulin does is it, it bonds to a receptor and then that opens up a channel that allows glucose to go into the cell and be stored, which therefore lowers the, um, the amount of sugar in the blood. So it lowers your blood sugar. So that is how that works. And that is why insulin is important because if not, then your blood sugar is just going to spike up. So that's kind of the anatomy that we're looking at when it comes to type one diabetes. So etiology, the exact cause of this is completely unknown. Um, they're thinking it's maybe something along the lines of there is a virus or something that could cause it or some sort of genetic predisposition. However, the exact mechanism of when this all kind of snowballs is pretty much unknown. Essentially, it is an autoimmune disorder because the body attacks its own cells. So in this case, the cells that are being attacked by the white blood cells are the pancreatic beta cells. And therefore, they're unable to produce any more insulin and boom, gone. They need that exogenous insulin to continue to have the bodily functions function normally. So as I said before, it's more common in children and teenagers. I believe the mean onset is between 11 and 13 years. And that is actually pretty accurate because my cousin actually has type one diabetes and I might be able to get her on here at some point to kind of like talk about it and maybe give you guys a little bit more insight on kind of what it's like day to day as a person with type one diabetes and things to look out for as a clinician. But for the boards right now, we need to understand that the pancreatic beta cells are completely destroyed and we need that exogenous insulin to be able to survive. So they are going to require injections every day or some sort of pump pumping an insulin into their body. So as I said before, this could be a genetic predisposition as why it happens. They've noticed that people whose parents have type one diabetes are more likely to have a child that has type one diabetes. So as I said before, this is the rare type of diabetes. Only five to 10% of individuals with diabetes have type one. The rest pretty much have type two, or as I might talk about in a future video, gestational diabetes. And that's something that can, that usually, that only happens with pregnancy as it says with gestational diabetes. So how is this going to look with a patient? So the most common symptom, and this is kind of what was happening with my cousin, I, I'm going to keep bringing her up because that's my best point of reference. And honestly, a lot of what she was experiencing and kind of how she's been navigating her life since her diagnosis is pretty much true for our board study. She, her, my aunt realized that she was drinking like gallons and gallons of water. Like I'm talking, she went through like eight bottles of water in like less than two hours. So that's that polyphagia you are in that polydipsia. So that's where you're just consuming, consuming water, 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 water. You're super thirsty. And that's kind of what's going on with that. So you'll also have that rapid weight loss. So she really wasn't, she all of a sudden was dropping like five to 10 pounds and she's a very skinny girl. So that was concerning that she was going into diabetic ketoacidosis as well. That is the pretty, that is a very dangerous condition that will eventually lead to coma and death. And this usually happens when your blood sugar gets super, super, super high. So this is because there's ketones forming in the blood because the sugar is not being placed into the cells. Therefore is kind of the spiral effect of ketones keep forming, 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 and that's super dangerous. So when she got to the hospital, after realizing that she had type one diabetes, her blood sugar was, I think almost like 600 and something. It was bad. It was very bad. That fatigue, all of a sudden they're tired all the time. They don't want to move anywhere. Blurred vision. This is because the nerves to the eyes are becoming 
there's, there's becoming sensory problems with the nerves to the eyes because the blood sugar is getting so high. So therefore the optic nerve starts to become affected. This is also why if you let diabetes go too long, you can develop, um, uh, you can lose your sense of sight. So then you also have that sweet fruity breath. And I don't know if any of you guys caught my, uh, teaser this morning on the Instagram, I kind of alluded to that as being um, a symptom of hyperglycemia. So that's because all of that um, glucose is kind of showing up into your breath and into your saliva as well. So you start smelling that sweet and fruity breath. This should be a concern because with when people have type one diabetes, their blood sugar is just going to keep climbing, climbing, climbing. It's not going to tank to the hypo because they, they don't have insulin producing anymore. So that means it's just going to keep going up, 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 and up because there's no insulin that's going to be bringing that blood sugar back down. This is also an important point here. It is an abrupt onset. So unlike type two diabetes, where you're slowly developing it over time, the insulin receptors are becoming down-regulated. It's there. The sensitivity is like, it's just bad. Then that takes a while because of all these um, lifestyle changes and dietary changes that could cause type two. Type one, on the other hand, because all of a sudden the body attacks itself and it's a attack on its own cells, it's abrupt, it's immediate, and you're going to start to see the problems with that showing up very quickly. And if type one diabetes is not treated quickly, the individual could pass away within a week. So how are we treating it? So we as PTs are not, and PTAs are not going to be the ones who are giving them insulin or prescribing them insulin or anything like that, or performing life-saving measures if they're getting into ketoacidosis. We're essentially treating these patients, and it's going to show up on the boards this way, as a maintenance kind of thing, just making sure that they're keeping track of their blood sugar and taking their insulin as needed and raising and lowering their blood sugar to stay within that healthy range so then they're not going swinging either way, either too low towards it like a coma or too high towards a metabolic ketoacidosis. So with this, we're going to be aware of our patients who have exogenous insulin that, as I said before, they might be injecting it or they might be using a pump. And I can eventually get a really cool picture of my cousin's pump just to show you guys kind of how it works. And it's pretty cool, actually, how you're able to just click some buttons and then all of a sudden they're like, okay, one unit of insulin, boom, there you go. Pretty cool. A lot of patients you'll see come in and they have this sensor on their arm. So it'll have like a, a, it's an oval shape. It'll have like a, almost like a tape. And then it'll be like a little electronic looking thing that is their sensor. So this could be hooked up to their phone or an app on their phone or something called a Dexcom. That's just like a brand name for one of these like phone looking sensors. Um, they could also be using just the test strip. So the poke your finger, get the blood test strip. That's kind of the old fashioned way, but many of our patients will still have this just in case their sensor and everything isn't working that day. Um, so you might also see these kind of terms show up on the board. So just kind of be aware of how individuals might be testing their blood sugar. We're going to be having nutritional management for these patients. And unlike type two, where it's, it could actually be quote unquote cured with diet and exercise, for our type one patients, it cannot be cured through diet and exercise. We're just making sure that they're um, not eating super sugary things to jack their blood sugar up too high and that they're making sure they're eating a correct amount of carbs just to have that awareness of their blood glucose level. So essentially with these patients, we're just trying to make sure that their glucose level is within a safe and, and um, manageable range. As I said before, that maintenance, there's no cure for this, unfortunately, right now. Lots of research is being done. Um, to try to see if there's any sort of way we can uh, make an artificial pancreas. They're getting somewhere with that stuff, but it seems like it's still a dream of science fiction at this point. Um, for us with PT-specific interventions, what we're trying to make sure is that they're having a safe and effective exercise program while also educating them to be aware of their blood glucose levels. Usually by the time you're getting type 1 patients, because they know if they're not managing their, their blood sugar levels, they're pretty much going to die. They are pretty, they are much better and more aware of their blood glucose levels than our type two patients who have a little bit more wiggle room one way or the other if they're dropping too high, too low. So making sure that our patients are exercising appropriately. So I have this point down here that exercise might elevate their blood glucose levels. So being aware of that if they're already kind of high when they're starting their program might want to be aware of that as they move through their program because it could just keep climbing, climbing. Essentially with these patients, we're doing very light exercise no more than 50 to 60% of their max heart rate. So that's kind of like a brisk walk um, because if we're exercising them too much, their blood sugar might quickly, quickly tank with 
um, using the insulin very quickly. So just making sure that these patients are being safe and the programs that we're gonna be designing and that might show up on the boards is just a general strengthening mobility and cardiovascular exercise. Nothing too strenuous or crazy because their body can't really handle that strenuous exercise. And if a, a type one diabetic would like to be more on the athletic level, it can happen. It just takes a lot, a lot of maintenance and making sure that they're aware of what's going on with their body. So lab values, these are really important. I would definitely keep an eye on this slide right here. Normal blood glucose for the boards, at least, is between 70 to 100 milligrams per deciliter. So that is the sweet spot range where if our patient is hanging out in there, we're good. Keep on exercising. Hypoglycemia is below 70. So that would be 69 or lower. If we have a patient like this and it's a situation on the boards, we're going to give them sugar and we're going to wait 15 minutes. That's kind of the standard here. I know as well. So give them sugar, wait 15 minutes, see what happens if their blood sugar starts to climb up, then okay, we're probably okay. If nothing happens, they might need some more sugar. They might even need a glucose tab. Um, hyperglycemia is when your blood sugar is too high. So for type one diabetics, and this is what the content outlet is stating that is the dangerous level is anything above 180. So if this is happening, the patient should already understand and be educated if they are of an age where they're independent with their insulin dosage, uh, tell the patient they would need to administer insulin and wait 15 minutes to see if their blood sugar starts going down. So essentially the big things is blood sugar is too low, give them sugar. Blood sugar is too high, give them insulin. That's kind of the big, um, the golden rule to be going by when it comes to diabetes, type one and type two, but we definitely want to be more on top of it with our type one patients because it's more dangerous if their glucose levels start going one way or the other. So keywords, I posted this beautiful picture earlier, but when it regards to type one diabetes, we're thinking of that polyuria. So they're peeing so much, the polydipsia, that's when they're the excessive thirst. So as I was saying with my cousin, she was drinking all of that water all in that short period of time, and she still felt thirsty. That was the big thing. So quick Google search, they realized that they, she needed to go to the hospital. Pancreatic beta cells. So the beta cells are the ones that have insulin, are the ones that produce insulin. So those are the ones we are really... Um, looking towards the pancreatic alpha cells, they produce glucagon and that has the opposite effect of insulin. So we're thinking of pancreatic beta cells when it comes to type one diabetes, that those are completely gone. Hyperglycemia or hypoglycemia, if you see that it's diabetes and then you have to decipher is it one or two or does it even matter for the question? When it, and then they need exogenous insulin. So that's insulin that comes from outside of the body. If they do not have, they do not produce any of their own insulins, our type two diabetics still do produce their own insulin, just their receptors are not working as well. So with our type one diabetes patients, they need that insulin or else they're done in like a couple of days. And then metabolic ketoacidosis. And I want to add one more thing under here is any sort of patient has a metabolic disease. That's another one. Um, so with metabolic ketoacidosis, that's what I was talking about earlier where the blood sugar goes so high that they end up in a coma. So sample question here, guys, a physical therapist assistant is treating a patient with a metabolic disorder. The patient checks their blood glucose level and notifies the assistant that their sensor reads 65 milligrams per deciliter. Which, what course of action should the physical therapist assistant take? One, administer one unit of insulin. Two, give the patient sugar-free candy. Three, give the patient apple juice. Or four, continue physical therapy. So I'll give you guys a couple seconds to think about that. I just realized that says physical therapist and not physical therapist assistant, but you guys know what I mean. All right, guys, the answer is give the patient apple juice. So apple juice is going to have tons of sugar in it that is going to help get that blood sugar up. Many patients who have type 1 diabetes have either apple juice, apple sauce, any sort of orange juice, anything with just quick sugar that they can get. They usually have it handy or at least around. If not, they have glucose tabs that can just give them straight sugar. So with number one, the main thing to be worried about with this question, I want to just point this out. When it says metabolic disorder, as I kind of just said before, that usually means um, type one diabetes or type two diabetes. So one of the diabetes. So the board likes to say metabolic disorder. 
when it's hinting towards diabetes. And I'd say like maybe 95% of the time they're meaning diabetes. So that's one of the weird words that they like to use. So they've checked their blood sugar every 65. As I said before, anything under 70, so 69 and below, that is hypoglycemia. So that means that they need sugar. Um, so what is the physical therapist doing? If they're administering insulin, they're gonna tank their blood sugar even more. Bad, don't do that. Um, that's one of those danger things. Don't do that. Number two, give the patient sugar-free candy. Sometimes sugar-free candy has this weird thing where it actually acts like sugar, but sugar-free candy when they need sugar because their blood sugar is going down, I guess it'll taste good, but that's definitely not the correct answer for what this patient needs at this moment. They need glucose and they need it now. Mm -hmm. Get the patient apple juice, boom, right on the money. That is what we want. Any sort of sugar to help raise that blood sugar up above that 70 mark. So we're back in that healthy and workoutable range. And then continue physical therapy. Their blood sugar is too low. We need to address that before we continue physical therapy. So giving the patient an apple juice, waiting 15 minutes, let's say it goes up to 78. All right, awesome. We're good. We're on the right track. We can start treating this patient again. All right, guys, that is everything I have for you guys today. Thank you for joining me and I will see you in the next video. Take care.